Order? Yes, we have two up there. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the University. My name is Jeff Clark. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Physiology and Health Science, and it's uh, my pleasure to get to introduce Dr. Wagen tonight. Thank you. Before I introduce Dr. Wagen, and, and uh, while you're here to, to listen to him, I'd like to uh, make a special recognition of those uh, organizations and people who've been responsible for sponsoring Dr. Wagen's visit here. Uh, the, and the, the following organizations are the Fisher Institute of Wellness, Smoke Free Indiana, Smoke Free Kids, the Department of Physiology and Health Science, and the American Cancer Society of Delaware County. So give our thanks to those folks. The last day and a half I've been able to spend considerable time with Dr. Wigan. I've got to know him fairly well and I've enjoyed the time. He's, he's uh, quite a pleasure to be around. And to tell you a little bit about Dr. Wigan, a little bit beyond all of the things that we've shared, I promise not to say some of the things he said to me, but uh, Dr. Wigan is, uh, is from New York City. He was born and raised in New York City and now calls uh, Charleston, South Carolina his home. He's earned academic degrees from the University of Buffalo School of Medicine and Bioscience biomedical science, excuse me, and recently obtained a master's degree in uh, secondary education from the University of Louisville. He's also taught Japanese and science at the DuPont Manual School, high school in Louisville. He's recognized nationally for his achievements as a educator. He's recognized as the first teacher, first class teacher of the year in 1996. He was one of uh, 51 teachers recognized nationwide for this. Currently, he uh, teaches a course in ethics at Chapel Hill University, North Carolina, uh, to primarily business stu students. He does research and publication uh, in areas of uh, cessation and cessation programs. Uh, he's also worked at some major uh, corporations, Pfizer Corporation, Johnson & Johnson. He's the vice was the vice president of research and development for Brown & Williams Tobacco Company second largest tobacco company in the world, if I remember correctly. And as also many of you may know him from um, his stint on 60 Minutes and uh, to bring to light some of the things that have occurred in the tobacco industry and currently works with and, in, in, um, uh, I guess, has organized a corporation called uh, Smoke Free Kids Incorporated. So without any more information about Dr. Wigan, please welcome Dr. Wigan to our campus. I'm somewhat tethered and as a, my, my, good, can everybody hear me? Good. I'm going to kind of wander around. I can't stay behind a podium. I'm kind of like a classroom teacher. I got to kind of wander around and look at people's faces. I have a number of things that I want to do tonight. And some of them are going to be pleasurable for folks to hear. And some of it is going to be a charge to exercise more duty and more responsibility. But I want to add to Dr. Clark's thank you. I mean, I to thank him for kind of shepherding me back, or up here, back to Muncie. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But also Lorraine Sinclair, who actually is the one that called me and is the organizer of this. I got to thank Lorraine Sinclair because she convinced me to come back to Muncie and come back to Indiana. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But I owe a debt of gratitude to many many, many people. And I owe that debt of gratitude for being able to be here tonight after many things that have happened over the last, so, 10 years. And so some of them are some folks from Indiana, and I'm going to talk about Nancy Delore in Indianapolis, who brought me first to Indianapolis just when all the stuff was hitting the fan. And I mean, I had to read a speech that day at the Ruth Lilly Foundation for a prepared text by my attorneys because there was, I was subject to enforceable of a restraining order that would put me in jail if I violated it. To Jeff Monaset, who was your ex-attorney general, who secured my release on June 20th with 39 other attorney generals from the lawsuit that the tobacco industry had amassed against me. 
It got me back my First Amendment rights then. And also to the people in Muncie, because I was up here in Muncie for the better part of three months during that original Wiley trial, and I got to live in the Radisson Hotel across from the convention center where the court was. And it's nice to come back because when I was at the Radisson the first time, it was a smoky environment. I come back today, or well, last night, it's a smoke-free environment. So if anything, So I got lots to share with you, some good, some bad. I have a charge. My charge is fourfold. First of all, Indiana has distinguished itself in terms of the responsibility to reduce harm associated with your children. It has chosen to spend, out of its settlement funds, about 20% of what is needed out of those funds to make an impact on the health issues associated with this state. Indiana has the distinction of being the fifth highest rate of loss of life associated with tobacco-related diseases in the country. Your state pays $1.2 billion a year as direct costs associated with sick smokers. 90% of the smokers in this state started as children, not as adults who understand the issues in, around tobacco, and it, but being duped as a child. The $36 million that your state has chosen to pay out of the settlement, billions of dollars it receives, helps build a legacy of having a smoke-free Indiana, reducing the $1 billion cost and reducing one of the highest rates of lung cancer in this country. I urge you, as we go forward, to take some of this information I'm going to share with you, and in the context of university, and that's why I came back, one of the university and the community bonding together to affect social change, paradigm shift. There's some work to be done. That $35 million plus dollars are at risk. That means that the economics of Indiana are causing people to rethink their duty to the inheritance of your children and your children's children and building a smoke-free environment. So that's number one. Make sure that the settlement funds that have been secured, which are the inheritance of your children and your children's children, continue to be used to produce the results that reduce the burden of health loss associated with tobacco use that $1.2 billion, and don't let them forget it, that that cost of $1.2 billion comes out of your pocket. Number two, is in 19, well, 1998, there was a lawsuit that started that said the FDA can regulate or should be able to regulate tobacco products. Let's tell you what's in the package, tell you how the nicotine's manipulated, tell you what the tar is, tell you when they leave pesticide residues in there, tell you when they leave fermentation associated with bacterial growth, and put it on the label, just like your Twinkies, your Oreo cookies, your candy bars, and any other product that you have, and put that. In the year 2000, the U.S. Supreme Court said that the FDA did not have the jurisdiction to regulate the product under the 1936 six Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act that allows the FDA to regulate cosmetics, foods, and pharmaceuticals. That the product, in quote, is too harmful, too dangerous, too maimy, and too addictive, and that the U.S. Congress needs to write a regulation that allows the FDA or another organization to regulate a product when used as intended kills 430,000 Americans and 4 million people in the world. It's the only product that is unlabeled, unregulated, that has this capacity. It costs us, in federal tax dollars, $90 billion in direct health care costs. It costs us a loss of $140 billion in productivity for legal products. 
And don't mistake, I am not advocating making it illegal. I'm going to be advocating to keep it away from our children and putting it in the proper context as a product that when used as intended, kills. There are 3,000 children a day in this country that become addicted. Average age, 11 to 12. Are they making a competent decision? Or are they being duped and manipulated by industry that only can prey on the weak and the young and the insecure? Does a child believe that when he picks up that first cigarette or the first dip, that they're going to attain thinness, sexuality, fun, athleticism, all with the advertising. This is an industry that spends $10 billion a year advertising this pro product, $10 billion. And if you divide the population of this country into the 10 billion, you understand what they spend per capita. But 90% of those who smoke today, do they smoke as adults, start smoking as adults? They started as children. It's a disease of our children. It's hoisted upon our children by having an image created of sexuality, of thinness, of fun, that turns into an addiction that's five times greater than cocaine or heroin and deprives them in the later years. So that's why I said my argument is for regulated. So that's number two. Help Congress understand, amongst its other priorities, that we want them to follow the, the directive of the US Supreme Court in regulating the product. Just like we want to regulate Firestone tires. And I want you to think about proportionality. US Congress wants to regulate Firestone tires, which took the lives of 200 people over a decade. They want to regulate accountants who want to fudge the books after the Anderson and the Enron situation. I want you to think about the, the indictments that are going on today of these executives, Skilling, Fastaw, Kowalski, et cetera, et cetera, who actually misused in a federal or that's a stockholder funds for personal enrichment. They rob people of their 401ks. They rob people of their, of their retirement funds. And now I will share with you that the tobacco executives didn't do anything that they robbed people of their lives. They, did, they deliberately and consciously for five decades plus, deliberately and consciously obfuscated, lied, whether it be on the oath or the public health, about the product they knew was addictive. In 1954, the tobacco industry clearly understood they were in a covert pharmaceutical business. Nicotine. They clearly understood that nicotine was the only reason people smoked. In 1974, the industry understood clearly that secondhand smoke was just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than actually smoking, particularly for pediatrics and peds. This is an industry that ultimately would go in front of the US Congress in April of 1994 and raise their right hand and swear under oath the product wasn't addictive, it didn't cause disease, it was there for taste and free choice. So when you understand that, should this be a product that was regulated like tires, like the balance sheet and accountants, should this product become unfettered by an outside body that regulates it and does it beg for regulation? Does it warrant regulation? And could we save lives by regulating it? And not making it illegal, make it regulated. Would you want to know when the tobacco product that you're using is contaminated with organic solvents, paint thinners? Would you want to know when your tobacco product 
is contaminated with pesticide residues. Would you want to know when the tobacco product that you're using is contaminated with bacteria? Would you want to know when the labeling of the product does not convey the intent of the product? When I label the product mild and light, I convey a message of what? Reduced risk. But did the industry ever tell anybody that they designed the cigarette to defeat the very testing that it co-opted with the Federal Trade Government or corporate, uh, Federal Trade Commission in terms of monitoring tar and nicotine, that the light monica and the mi mild monica are greatly understated in terms of what the true delivery is and how predominantly the female gender is paid the price for mild and light. Should they be able to use those monicas? Third. Do we need to spend time more with our children, giving them competencies to understand how they're being manipulated? And that means going out to the schools and at home, having good work. I go up, most of my time is spent in fourth and fifth grade classrooms around the world, giving kids the opportunity to analytically and, cri and critically think about how the industry targets them. And I spent today a little bit in the middle school and these kids thirst for this kind of knowledge. So they are the targets of the industry. Those are the ones that are waiting to be manipulated. So I urge you to get out and deal with the issues of school and the kids, from family to school, and give them those competencies. And as I charge the kids in here at the university, go out and do the social responsibility activities that allow you to share your knowledge in chemistry and biology and wellness and history and journalism and publishing and share with the kids so they don't become manipulated. And the last thing is the whole issue of how we deal with integrity in our lives. And I must tell you, I am startled at what's going on today. The Enrons and the Qualcomms show that we have become so immediately gratification, materialistically driven that we'll do damn near anything to get it. And I must tell you, it's upsetting to me. And where these folks stole money, the industry I worked for for four years and three months stole lives. <coughs> and they did it in personal enrichment. I want to kind of jump a little bit now into what was it like inside the tobacco industry? What, ha what went on in there? And I only can give you a picture. And I only can give it a picture through my eyes of, my, of things I experienced. I want to tell a little bit about the aftermath. I want to talk a little bit about the movie. And I want to come back to my four charges that I started with. How do you, does this function this week? The university and the community, the power of one coming together to make a difference. Can you make a smoke-free Indiana? Can you make a smoke-free Muncie? Can you give kids better competencies? And my answer to that, together as this is, you can do it. It has happened. And I have to say, if I was to bet on Indiana in 1997 doing what it did, I must say that through the effort and courage of a lot of politicians, you have the benefit of some of that and not to let it go. Don't let it go. It's your children and your children's children. And that money and that opportunity is their inheritance. And as we leave this world for whatever short time, we need to leave it for the next generation. And we shouldn't saddle the next generation with what we've experienced through. Am I going too fast? I mean, I'm from the Bronx, so I mean, I, gotta, I talk fast. So let's move on a little bit. I spent 25 years in corporate America. My 25 years was spent basically Fortune 10 healthcare pharmaceutical companies. Companies such as like Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and Merck. I was paid well. And I also though worked in companies where science was used for the search for truth. And where science was used to make lives healthier, reduce pain, extend lives, and make products that increased 
people's productivity and lifespan. And I did that for 25 years. And I chose in 1988 to leave that environment and join a tobacco company. And I did it consciously for a number of specific reasons. And I'm going to share them with you. Number one is I had daughters that were two years old and two months old, and I lived in the New York City area. And I thought that I didn't want them to experience the same way I grew up in New York City. So I wanted to get them outside New York City into a different environment. Brown and Williamson offered me that opportunity because I got to take them from New York City area to Louisville, Kentucky, where the quality of life was substantially different, and their grandparents also lived there. So A, I had immediate, I thought, family benefit. Second, I got what I thought and I believed after six months of intensive interviews with the senior management of not only B&W, but Battis, and also BAT, the parent company in the UK, that I would be able to use the science I'd used for so long to address a product that, when used as intended, killed. I clearly understood before I went to the company that nicotine was addictive. I clearly understood that a cigarette or a cigar or pipe tobacco, when it burns, generates four to 8,000 toxic chemicals that in many cases, in many states, you cannot legally bury them, which are garbage. They are so toxic. And I believe that you could make a safer cigarette, a cigarette that reduced the biological risk for those as adults who are either addicted or chose to take on risky behavior. The third is a big difference in salary. I want to make from making roughly about $200,000 a year in compensation to close to half a million dollars in compensation. And so I thought I had the best of all worlds. Family, personal, and the opportunity to use my, the science that I'd used so well. I also had a daughter that was born with a congenital defect. And that defect required substantial medical care. And I needed good health care coverage. And that also came with the package. So I left Merck, and I moved into Louisville, Kentucky. I can't take you through all the four years and three months at this company. I can give you some snippets. It's a fact. And I urge you all at the end of it, if you want to understand more, to go to the archaeology of this industry and this company captured in 33 million documents. Read what they think about children. Read what they think about self-enrichment. And see what I say is not corroborated over and over and over again. Joined the company, and one of the first things I did was I was sent out to a law firm in Kansas City, Missouri, to go out and find and understand how Litigation was it, because I may have become a, a, a witness. And it was the first time in my career I ever had lawyers tell me how to think about science. They told me that there was two fundamental tenets by which they survive litigation. Number one, they never would acknowledge the relationship between smoking and health. It's called the causal hypothesis. The second, they would never admit that nicotine's addictive, even though they talked about it inside outside, because then if it was addictive, it would, re it would no longer be free choice. And I thought it was strange that lawyers would tell me the science that I had read so much before and discussed during the interview process. Whoa. Well, I went back to the company, and I, all I wanted to do was make a safer cigarette. Take the carbon monoxide out. Take some of the nail polish remover out. Paint thinners and other poisons that come in it. And so we assembled the scientists throughout this $25 billion company, the heads of science. And we gathered in British Columbia for four and a half days of meetings of how to go into the technology portfolio, the pocket of the companies, and pull out technology without risk that could be applied to reducing nicotine's addictiveness. How to make a cigarette fire safe. How to reduce carbon monoxide. How to use genetic engineering to change nicotine content how to deal with the issue of secondhand smoke. And we spent four and a half days when we articulated the antithesis of my March meeting with the lawyers. We clearly understood in the company, in the scientific community as well as the business community of the company, that nicotine was addictive. We clearly understood 
that smoking caused emphysema, cardiac vascular disease, cancer. And we had ways of doing it, grabbing into a technology package and pulling it out. And we articulated it in a memo after the meeting, in 14 pages of memorandum that said, we can do this, we can do this, and we can do this generally within less than 18 months. We could take nicotine and take it and change its addictive and depressive qualities. That is, it causes depression, particularly in women. We could take and make a cigarette that's fire safe, that it didn't cause the loss of 1,200 lives a year, mostly children, firefighters, and non-smokers through careless cigarettes. We could take genes of tobacco plant and change them by using contemporary molecular biology and genetic engineering techniques. And we wrote it down. We knew when nicotine was addictive, and we knew that smoking created hazard. Well, as in business, you circulate your memo. I circulated the, the report of the meeting to my boss, the COO of the company. And all I can characterize is his response was apoplectic. I had created a document, or participated in creating a document that could be used in a court of law. I said the company clearly understood nicotine was addictive and it was manipulated, that they targeted kids, they could make fire safe cigarettes, they targeted women based on weight management, etc. And you could make a safe cigarette. What happened next, 25 years of corporate experience didn't prepare me for. The president of the company ordered an attorney who was not present at the meeting to change the minutes of the meeting. He took 14 pages of minutes and reduced it to two and a half pages of vanilla. And that became the permanent record to reflect the meeting. Wow. I never saw anything like that. I never saw that in J&J. &J. I never saw that in Pfizer. And immediately on the tail of that, the CEO of BAT Industries, Sir Patrick Shee, never wanted to create the scientists or any doctor and they create a document that could be considered controversial or indicting in a court of law. And we were called now to New York City in January of 1990. And we were told that lawyers would be put in every facet of scientific communication and research. If a document that was generated that was controversial in terms of the health, con health issue, it would be either destroyed, sequestered overseas, altered, or never part of the permanent record. Communications between the scientists and other scientists was going to be controlled by lawyers. Well, I don't know what I was going to do. And I'm sitting here in January of 1990 now. I'm a year plus in a company. I got a half a million dollar salary. I got a house, a family. My safer cigarette project now is canceled and shipped overseas because now if you have something safer, everything else is unsafe and it created a tremendous amount of consternation in the company against product liability. And I didn't know what to do with what I knew. I couldn't go back to the pharmaceutical industry. I wanted no part of being on any adversarial, adversarial role with the tobacco company because I learned how they treated defectors rather quickly. And I basically turned and looked the other way. I didn't know what to do with I, I knew and that responsibility. And many trouble, I got many times in conflict with Mr. Sanford over the years when they exported genetically engineered tobacco seed to Brazil to grow tobacco down there by smuggling the seed out in a cigarette pack in violation of the law. Or by forcing the scientists and the product developers to smoke tainted cigarettes. Or moving science to political legal issues. It came down to August 1992. And I was having a tough time looking in the mirror. I was also having a tough time explaining to my two girls who were going to private schools why the job I was doing was killing people. In August of 1992, I received a copy of the draft report for the National Toxicology Program. It has to do with one of the additives that the company uses in its tobacco. Something that's added to tobacco to ameliorate the harshness of smoke and to facilitate the manipulation of nicotine. 
The tobacco industry uses 599 chemical additives to tobacco. Cocoa, licorice, honey, toilet bowl cleaner, car antifreeze, and etc. One of these additives in 1984 was demonstrated clearly to be a hepatotoxic agent in dogs that has destroyed the livers of dogs. It also made sweet, sweet smelling out of foul smelling and mass foul odors. As a result, the Food and Drug Administration removed this additive from a list that's called GRASS, generally recognized as safe. And the tobacco industry removed from all its cigarettes this chemical compound in 1984 because of the health concern and because of the regulation. They were also at the same time required to disclose to the government under law the additives they used in cigarettes. Brown and Williamson continued to use the additive even though it took it out of its lucky strike and its Viceroy and other cigarettes. They continued to use it in this Walter Raleigh aromatic pipe tobacco. In August of 1992, this chemical compound called coumarin was found to be a lung-specific carcinogen in laboratory mice and rats when tested by the National Toxicology Program. I took this information to my boss, Mr. Sandifer, who I had many run-ins with, and told him it was the duty of care and his responsibility to remove this chemical compound because now they had incremental information that put people at more in harm's way. His response to me was, go back to the laboratory and find a substitute. They were not going to remove it because it would affect sales and profits. He wasn't going to take it out and reduce risk at the expense of causing loss of money. Well, that was sort of the Waterloo. That was my last conversation with Mr. Sandifer over duty and responsibility. Several months later, he became the new CEO, and he summarily fired me in March of 1993. And actually, quite, I was quite relieved to be fired. And I only really wanted one thing. I wanted to forget four years and three months and go back to where I belonged. I want to go back to the pharmaceutical industry. I wanted to go back to where I was not being challenged every day with doing things I felt uncomfortable with and had to look the other way. In fact, you must say or think, I most certainly lost my moral compass. And all I wanted was my contract. I wanted my health care benefits for my one daughter. I wanted two years, my severance, which was by contract. And all I want to do is use it to get back to where I belong. And the first thing the company said to me is they're not going to honor their contract. They're going to redu substantially reduce the... I said, well, no, you, the hell you aren't. I'm going to go get me a Kentucky lawyer and I'm going to sue you under contract law. Well, you know how that worked out. I hear it already. I couldn't get a Kentucky lawyer to come near me to sue the tobacco company <laughs> for my contract. In June of 1993, I worked out an agreement with the company. I got two years severance, and I got my health care benefits. And I was a fat cat. I was done. So I thought. September of 1993, they sue me ex parte in a Kentucky court for violation of my confidentiality agreement and giving away trade secrets. They alleged that I told somebody my salary and that constituted violation of my agreement. They took my health care benefits away from me. They took my salary away from me. But they offered me, on the other hand, an opportunity to sign a more restrictive and more draconian type agreement than ever. And rather than put my family in harm's way, I signed the agreement which basically said I could never tell anybody about tobacco, nothing that I ever learned or knew, and I would always keep it secret. But if I was challenged or asked by a law instrument of law, I would have to tell them first they had a right to have an attorney present, and away I went. And so October of 1993, I'm um, again, got a new agreement, yet I protected my family. And now things are starting to happen. The things that start happening change my understanding of what do you do with what you know. In January of 1994, I was approached by a CBS correspondent by the name of Lowell Bergman. Lowell had been the beneficiary or the recipients of anonymous documents sent to him 
by a Mr. Butts. Mr. Butts was a conscious of one of the companies that pulled a set of documents out that reflected the research efforts of the world's largest tobacco company. It dealt with the issue of how they could develop a product that didn't create a fire. But remember, there are 1,200 lives lost each year in this country directly attributable to fires created by cigarettes. This company developed the Fire Safe Cigarette in 1986. They called it Hamlet, to burn or not to burn. <laughs> well, I sat across from this company in a Congress-directed law called the Moakley Bill that said that the, the tobacco industry could work collaboratively together to develop a fire safe cigarette to address this loss of human life and property. And I sat down against this, across from this company for the better part of three years in which each and every time they asserted that it was impossible to make a cigarette fire safe, that that was the responsibility of the furniture makers and the rug makers and the bedding makers. In 1986, they had a fire safe cigarette that smoked like a Marlboro, tasted like a Marlboro, looked like a Marlboro, and had no incremental cost of a Marlboro, and was fire safe and it boiled my blood. It bothered me that they directly had an opportunity to change at least 1,200 lives. And, it and then I started in a whole different pathway. I needed to do something with my knowledge. The US Congress was cranking up at the time. And they were asking whether the FDA could assert jurisdiction over nicotine. They were also now going to bring in the seven CEOs on a congressional subpoena and ask them, is it nicotine addictive or not? Does smoking kill or not? Do you target minorities or not? Do you target young women or not? Do you label your product correctly? And in the process, the Congress asked me if I could help them understand tobacco science and how to ask the questions, and could I testify? And I said, most well, certainly I can help Congress, but you need to give me an instrument of law. And the communications back and forth between the Congress and they were daily. And I had a duty under my contract that I signed to tell the company I was contacted by Congress. And so I told them. And after I told them, my children were recipients of two separate independent death threats that said if I cooperated with anybody against the tobacco industry, they would take it out of my children. It required the FBI to trap and trace my phones, and they isolated the phone calls. One came from a hospital in Louisville. The other came from a building adjacent from the Brown and Williamson Tower. From that day forward, I never told them what I was doing. So when the seven CEOs in April got up in front of Congress and all raised their right hand and said that nicotine wasn't addictive and smoking was no more dangerous than Twinkies, I realized that by my silence, I was no different than the people on my screen. And I chose to do some things different. I started working covertly with the F FDA. I traveled back and forth under assumed names, went through unmarked entrances, and helped work through that jurisdictional document I told you about in the front. I got involved in a $10 billion lawsuit between ABC News and Philip Morris over nicotine manipulation. And I got to read, in early 1995, documents that spanned 25 years that were leaked out of Brown and Williamson called the Merrill Williams documents where they talk about the Deadwood files and targeting. And many of the documents I asked to see when I was at the company, I now see for the first time. So on August 5th, armed with this information, I chose to set my moral compass straight. I went to CBS 60 Minutes, and I told them that I wanted to work out a way to bring this information forward to the public. But I had to do it with some caveats. I needed to make sure that if it went, if and when it went forward, that I had some form of physical protection, primarily for my children. And second, that I needed to have a lawyer because I knew damn well now I was going to need a good lawyer. And they agreed to it. This comes right on the tails of that ABC Philip Morris litigation of $10 billion. ABC apologizes to Philip Morris, concomitant with ABC being bought by Disney. The first time, First Amendment, freedom of the press, is now usurped by the tobacco industry. CBS has this interview in the can. 
They have validated it. They've done the authenticity and they fact checked it. And then several things are going on within CBS. CBS now is being tendered an offer by Westinghouse to buy the corporation. And there are significant economic gains to be gained by the management of CBS, Lowe's Corporation, Lorillard Tobacco. Because one of the owners of CBS through Lowe's Corporation, Mr. Tish and his brother were one of the seven invitees to the April 1994 congressional testimony session. And he was being investigated by the U.S. Department of Justice for perjury. Well, that wasn't quite enough. To make the, di the soup a little bit dicier, Brown and Williamson and Lorillard were conducting a $100 million product transfer from B&W to Lorillard Tobacco. CBS dropped the interview under threat of a $15 billion lawsuit based on a legal principle called tortious interference. They tortured me for the truth. No. <laughs> it's a legal principle that says that if you interfere, you're torturing, you, there's a tortious interference in terms of in disrupting a confidentiality agreement. A CBS dropped the interview. The acquisition went through unfettered with a threat. And then fireworks started. Somebody within CBS leaked the interview to the New York media. New York media printed the original story in context. And I was immediately sued again in Kentucky, ex parte. That means they went to court without a legal represent, And they took my First Amendment rights away with a restraining order. And the fireworks start. I also now receive two armed ex-secret service agents that provide 24-7. They started taking my children to Girl Scouts, to school, to the store, start my car in the morning, open my mail, go to the school I'm teaching at. Because now the threats against my physical and my family were routine. I have also was subpoenaed in November 95 to go to Mississippi, provide testimony, to provide the same thing on the oath that I gave to CBS freely on, in, in August of 95. There again, I faced jail. I went down, I stayed at Dick Scruggs' home, who was my attorney, with the Attorney General, the number one law enforcement agent of Mississippi, who was the first, by the way, to sue the tobacco industry to recoup the health care costs. And before I could stay at Dickie's home that night, they had to screen the home for listening devices, because many of the attorneys that were suing the tobacco industry now found that electronic eavesdropping was an active act in their offices and homes. Judges' chambers were being bugged. People were being followed. And there were credible death threats against many of the people that were trying to bring the tobacco industry to the bar of justice. And therefore, the property was patrolled all night by armed Mississippi State troopers. Not a very warm welcome to the Gulf of Mexico. Next morning, I did the federal deposition. In the afternoon, I was to go forward with the civil deposition. As tell on the oath everything that I had told CBS freely. And Brown and Williamson went to the Mississippi Supreme Court and got the Mississippi Supreme Court to seal the document but not cancel it. They went to the same judge again in Kentucky and got a contempt order, which said if I honored the subpoena in Mississippi, I would violate the Kentucky order, and therefore I would be incarcerated when I came back to Kentucky. I didn't learn this until I sat down to lunch with the Attorney General of Mississippi, the attorneys, people from the Department of Justice, that if I was to go forward in the afternoon, when I went back to Kentucky, they would throw me in jail. And that scared the hell out of me. I did not want to go to jail in Kentucky or any jail for telling the truth. And to the credit of these men, they gave me an opportunity to get out of it. They said, it's your decision. And I spent half hour, 45 minutes, I can't remember, wandering around on the lawn of Dickie Scruggs' home trying to figure out what to do with what I knew. What was my duty and should I exercise my duty now? And fortunately, I made the right decision because I realized I had already paid the price and no matter what happens, I would never get the opportunity to go forward again if I didn't do it then. So I went forward and if you haven't read a Mississippi, the Mississippi deposition that's on my website and other 
printed it. You need to read it and understand what went on there. I went back to, flew back to Kentucky that night on a private plane, and I was met by federal marshals, and I was escorted home. I did not go to jail. I went back to teaching biology, chemistry, and Japanese at Manual High School. January 1996 rolls around. The very deposition that was sealed in Mississippi makes its way to the bastion of business reporting, the Wall Street Journal. They're going to print the story from the deposition, the very deposition and material that CBS 60 Minutes faulted on. They get threatened by the tobacco company again. Should they print the story, they would be sued. And to the great credit of this, these journalists and the Wall Street Journal, they published a complete deposition on that threat. And it was out. In January 1996, somebody managed, even when we had two armed bodyguards, to put a bullet in my mailbox and remind me again that if I continue on the pathway I was going, that they wouldn't take care of me, they would take care of my two daughters, no matter where they were. February 1996, CBS airs the original program of August 1995 after the threat of the lawsuits and the acquisition complete. Not what I would call a stellar performance in terms of exercising a free speech, freedom of the press. June 20th of 1997 rolls around. 39 states, including Indiana, had sued the tobacco industry for reclaiming the health care costs that were amassed over decades and decades. They had $368 billion in settlement costs, unfettered FDA regulation, release of documents, and restrictions on advertising to the youth. And the last thing the attorney generals asked is that the Brown and Williamson and the tobacco industry dropped their lawsuit against me. And they refused to do it. And to the great credit, including Jeff Monaset, who was your attorney general at the time, they in unison said that unless you dropped the lawsuit, they would walk out. And so on June 20th of 1997, I was free to speak my piece and share it. Since then, I've gone back. I taught high school until Brown and Williamson made it so unbearable that I couldn't teach in Louisville anymore. I was National Teacher of the Year in 1996. They were subpoenaing my classroom records and reviewing them. I decided in 1998 to leave Louisville, Kentucky and move to Charleston, South Carolina. And I formed Smoke Free Kids with the belief that my corporate experience, as well as my education, I could bring in the classroom setting, particularly kids before they ever had their first experience with tobacco, the ability to understand how they are manipulated, that by smoking cigarettes doesn't make you thin, girls, and that if you stop smoking, you're not going to get fat and that this is imagery and fighting the battle to make sure the states start using some of that $246 billion that they received in the settlement. The movie, The Insider, was not part of the equation. In the beginning when everything was happening, many of us that were involved worried about survival, not success. I can tell you my, car, my, my lawyer, Ron Motley, still has a bodyguard. The Attorney General of Mississippi, who got death threats, they finally caught him four years later. Many of the people that were involved in changing this dynamic gave of themselves. I don't know what I would have done if I wasn't teaching school and had the loyalty of 153 kids and the support of them. Well, many of this, what I'm telling you, is happening. For they were the substance that allowed me to do what I did. I have no regrets. I would most certainly do it again. I share this with you tonight in the context of what university means and how you, whether you're a member of the community, whether you're a member of the academic setting, your students, your teacher, or lawyers, or policemen, how you can collectively work together with the young and the old to make this a better and more productive environment for your children and your children's children. Unless we change this dynamic by regulating this industry, creating smoke-free environments, raising the price, offering cessation to people who become addicted that have no choice but the addiction, to deal with the depression, to facilitate it, we will be strapped with this $90 billion cost 
the loss of $140 billion in productivity, you personally will continue paying your part of Medicaid or Medicare in terms of the $1.2 billion. So I go back to the original. We need to make sure that we keep the settlement monies used, this $35 plus million dollars a year that comes out of the some $12 billion the state will receive. We need to continue to aware, make our politicians aware that they were elected with a duty for the future. That is that they need to support continued use of it as well as asking the Congress to regulate this product. We need to give our kids an opportunity to understand how they're going to be duped or manipulated before they get hooked. Indiana has a large issue associated with tobacco use. It takes lives. It's the fifth highest in the United States in terms of lives lost associated with tobacco disease. It's your community. It's your opportunity to do the right thing. I'm going to stop there and just give you a little, little time to see two and a half minutes of the flick. I want to tell you a little bit about that, and then we can try some questions and answers. Thanks for being patient. Thank you for keeping going. Let's try it, and then let's give you a chance to catch up a little bit. Down. We can air it. The worst kind of an organized smear campaign against a whistleblower. Shoplifting, failing to pay child support. They can paint everything with that brush. What, what are you going to do now? You're going to finesse me, lawyer me some Mike. more? Try Mr. Wallace. If we aired this segment... I was told... Don't talk! Mind my own business. We could be a grave risk. We're doing this with or without you, Lord. Are you a businessman or are you a newsman? He's only the key witness in a big public health reform issue in the U.S. Yes, of course, because he's not telling the truth. No, because he is telling the truth. And the more truth he tells, the worse it gets. You manipulated me into this. I fought for you, and I still fight for you. The American public need to know. Jeffrey? And you wish you hadn't come forward? Dr. Wagon's deposition will be part of this record. You wish you hadn't blown the whistle. Jeffrey! Do I think it's worth it? I told the truth. It's valid and true and to these people. That's not the point whether you tell the truth or not. As I said, in the beginning, we didn't think that was going to happen. I mean, I have to say there were many dark moments. And this vindication comes with sort of icing on the cake. It comes at the cost of a lot of people in effort. I ask you to leave here tonight and think, if I robbed you of your savings by misrepresenting your stock investment portfolio, what would you want to do? If I rob you of your children's health or your health by lying to you, what should you do? And what's the proportionality? We want to regulate Enrons and accountants for unethical, amoral behavior. Yet, we have failed to recognize that this industry hoists upon us a burden of health loss, disease that attacks the weak. Thank you.